we left off last week, uh, we covered through verse 10, but we're going to start by reading verse 10 of chapter 1, and we're going to read down through verse 14 of chapter 2. And I think it's fitting that we have that, that line, um, when he shall come with trumpet sound, may I then, then in him be found, dressed in, in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. And that fits so well with this theme that uh, Paul is talking about in this book of Galatians, that we're dressed in the righteousness of Christ and not our own. So, if you've uh, found your way there, we're in Galatians chapter 1, starting in verse 10. Would you stand one more time, if you are able, in honor of God's Word? Hear the Word of the Lord. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. But I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born, who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him fifteen days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. And what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it said, He who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God because of me. Then, after fourteen years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaimed among the Gentiles, in order to make sure I was not running or had had not run in vain. But even Titus who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might bring us into slavery, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And from those who seem to be influential, What they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed to be influential added nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, They gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile, not like a Jew, how can you force Gentiles to live like Jews? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this text, and I pray that you would build up our faith in Jesus Christ. And those who may need to be saved, I pray that you would save. And those that are already saved, I pray that you would continue to build up our faith and persevere us to the end. 
through the preaching of your word, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So Ravi Zacharias is probably a name that many of you are very aware of. Uh, he used to be a favorite apologist of mine. I used to listen to his lectures, watch his videos, and things like that all the time, his sermon, his speeches, his debates. In fact, as a teacher, I used to show his, his debates to students to kind of help train them on how to engage unbelievers. When it, and it's still very recent, when it came out recently that he had had multiple sinful relationships that covered a span of several years of his ministry and that was uncovered, uh, it shocked me. It was, I was completely blown away and probably several of you were also blown away by that as well. And I know probably many of unbelievers at that time blasphemed the way at that, at that revelation that he had lived that way. I didn't necessarily think that way. I just simply stopped listening to it. If I were to go back and listen to some of his lectures, I would probably say they're true and they're actually good. But I just simply stopped listening, listening to them because of the character that I, I associated uh, with that speaker. I just couldn't make myself do it. I still don't listen to him today. I don't think the things that he said in themselves are bad, but because of the character, he's discredited in my mind. And this can happen in other contexts too. We've actually seen this, um, you know, you might see it in the news, uh, and I'm not going to mention anyone specific, but even when false accusations are made, and that was, Robbie Zacharias was a true thing that they have found out, but even when false accusations are made, that bring someone's character into question, terrible things happen. Even if you find out the accusations are false. It's almost like you can't remove that picture in your mind of that person's character. And one result is you stop listening to that person, right? You stop giving your attention to that person because you're thinking, I, I, don't, I don't know if I can trust what they're saying. I start out like that because I think Paul's dealing with this. Paul has planted many churches, but he's dealing with people who are probably slandering his name, slandering his character, speaking ill of him. And he was not guilty of any sin, like as I was speaking of. It was just false accusations raised by false brethren coming in and discrediting Paul and his message. And the Galatians were listening. Unfortunately, they were listening to these false brethren. And Paul, in a way, because his, credit, his character is being called into question, he, he's kind of dealing with a, the idea of being discredited by his church that he's labored over. And you can imagine, this is something that pastors have to deal with at times. So you, you think you labor, labor, labor over people, you plant a church, and then... As we saw last week, I'm astonished so quickly, so quickly, they're following other teaching. And he feels like he's being discredited. Tom Schreiner says probably that these adversaries considered themselves to be Christians. That's why Paul calls them false brethren. They may have been Christians proclaiming what they believed to be the gospel in their mind. Very, probably very loquacious, very eloquent speakers, maybe very powerful. It seems to indicate that uh, they may have said things like, oh, Paul was preaching to you a gospel that was good, but maybe good for the minor leagues. We want to we want to prepare you for the major leagues. We want to prepare you the full gospel. You need Jesus and, and then they said circumcision, but you, as we saw last week, this type of language, Jesus and, is not flying with Paul. But they're preaching this message. They may have been saying things like, Paul realized you were Gentiles and he wanted to maybe not offend you and so he relaxes the requirement of circumcision so as not to offend you because we know Paul's trying to please man. He's trying to please man and he doesn't want to offend you so he probably relaxed it. We don't want to please man, we want to please God so you need Jesus and circumcision. Now, that's a little bit of mirror reading, a little bit of building up of the text. Whatever they were saying about Paul, Paul felt that it was necessary to spend a significant amount of time vindicating himself 
and his ministry and his gospel. And this is what we're dealing with in all of these verses. He's, he is vindicating um, his ministry, his apostolic ministry that is truly from God. It's not there to impress man. It's not from man, and it's for their good. So looking at this text, I want to break it down into kind of three sections. And then I'm going to draw points of application. So kind of the way the sermon is going to flow is I'm going to look at each section. And then at the end, I'm going to give you three points of application. Because of the nature of how long the section is, obviously it's a little bit longer than we dealt with last week. There are certain things that we'll talk about tonight, Sunday night. We may have to deal with a couple of verses that you may have questions about. So I encourage you, if you have some questions, you know, write them down and ask tonight as we kind of have our debrief. But the sections go like this. I'm looking at verse 11 of chapter 1 through verse 24. That's going to be a single section. This is where Paul is vindicated by the message that he proclaims. The second section that I'm going to unpack will be in chapter 2, starting in verse 1, and it'll be down through verse 10. And this is where Paul is confirmed, you might say, by the pillars. And then the last section is going to be those last few verses, chapter 2, verse 11, down through verse 14. This is where Paul confronts a pillar. That's kind of how I'm breaking it down here. So we have Paul is vindicated, his, his apostolic ministry is vindicated there in the first section, where he's confirmed, and then he confronts in the third section. So... Let's look at the first section together. Paul, vindicated by the message he proclaims. I read verse 10 because I think verse 10 sets the tone for what's to follow. He says in verse 10, Am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. We need to keep that in mind because the accusations become Paul's doing this basically to for man. He's just, he's not, he's, he's, ser he's a servant of man. He's not serving the Lord. And Paul, right off the bat, goes in to basically just say, that is not the case. I am not trying to please or serve man. I'm trying to please and serve God. And he tells them of his history, of his background. He essentially goes into story mode. And so let's look at it. He talks about his conversion and his calling. Let's consider what Paul says here. He says, I'll have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached to me is not man's gospel. In the Greek it says, not according to man. I didn't receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Verse 13, you heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And he goes on. He talks about his former life in Judaism. Why would he do that? What we know about Paul and what we've studied about Paul for a long time on Sunday nights is Paul was doing very well in his former manner of life. He was, in the religious sense, in a cultural sense, in a social sense, maybe even in a political sense, at the top of his game. He, was, he, had, he won the award, so to speak. He was the valedictorian of his class, however you want to say it. The Oxford or the Cambridge, pick your poison, uh, grad. He was, at the high, he was at the tribe of Benjamin, he says, and he boasts about this, if you will, in the book of Philippians. Paul probably saw himself, Tom Schreiner says, in the line of Phineas and, and Elijah. He says, so extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my father. And you can think back of those Old Testament great ones who were very zealous for the law and for God and so on and so forth. And he was advancing beyond all his fellow peers. They weren't keeping up with him. He studied under Gamaliel. Indeed, when he was proclaiming the gospel, men said to him, your great learning, Paul, is essentially going to your head. It's, 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 it's too much for you. You're going off the deep end. Paul was a very smart, very intelligent, a very advanced person. And he knew that about himself. He's not, he's not boasting because he's proud. He's telling you this because he's wanting to make this point. If it were true that I were trying to please man, I never would have started 
proclaiming the gospel. That would be illogical. That would be stupid. Right? Look at all of the persecution that Paul had to go through. The beatings, the cold nights, the shipwrecks, and all the rest. And why would I give up this amazing position if I were still trying to please man, I was doing just fine before Christ came along and ransomed me. And then these people are thinking, well, is, am I still trying to please man? Of course not. That doesn't make sense. But he was miraculously saved by the grace of God. And he was called out of that life that was man-centered, man-focused, man-advancement. And he was called for true upward advancement. Not in Judaism, because you can only get so far. You can't get life in the Spirit. You can't get true uh, salvation there by the law. God called him out of this. And he's telling them this to win his hearers back. And keep that in mind, right? He's trying to show them the, just the illogical conclusion here of some of the things that his false, these false brethren are accusing him of. This doesn't work. I would have stayed where I was if it was for man. He says, I was a persecutor of the church of God. I mean, we know he was from the tribe of Benjamin. Genesis chapter 49, right? Benjamin is a ravenous wolf, and he tore the church apart. And that was a thing to boast of. Because the church was something that was against the traditions of the fathers. Against, if in his mind, right? Against, against his advancement. But whatever gain he had, he counted it as loss. His conversion and his calling, this miraculous saving of Paul, which was entirely by the grace of God, is evidence that he is not doing this for man. This proves that he is serving God and not serving man. So this is the first section that I think he's dealing with. It's very basic. He goes on and he says, I didn't receive this gospel from man. He couldn't say, I went to this school. I learned these things. And therefore, I'm proclaiming it to you. Did not receive it from a human teacher, if you will. He says, I did not, in verse 17, I didn't go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. I went away into Arabia, returned again to Damascus. He said earlier that it's not the gospel that he received was not according to the man. In verse 12, I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. But I received it directly from Christ. They didn't even know Paul, you might even say, very well. He says, then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem, saw Cephas, stayed with him 15 days, didn't see anyone else except James, the Lord's brother. And what I'm writing to you, I'm not lying. This is not a lie. I'm not trying to trick you. I'm telling you the truth. I've received the gospel from God himself, not from man, and I'm not doing this for man. He's laboring, brothers and sisters, to show the people that he has worked so hard for, to win, you might say, for Christ, to build back up his credit so that they will start listening. These false brethren come in, and that's a very characteristic thing of false brethren, to try to discredit true brothers, to slander not only true apostolic preachers, but the message itself. They want to change the message, and they want to slander true preachers of the gospel. And he's building this back up. So this is what I believe he's communicating here in the first section. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on and he talks about in chapter 2, starting in verse 1 down through verse 10, adding on to the story. And he shows that even among the apostles, he is receiving confirmation. So let's walk through this text together to see why this is important. At first, right, receive the gospel from God. He's not serving man. He is serving God. He loves the people that he's proclaiming the gospel to. And then he goes on and he says this, chapter 2. After 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I had proclaimed among the Gentiles. Let's just pause there. 
Who is he speaking to? Who is he speaking about them? But he's speaking about the apostles. Okay? And specifically, it's not just like we think of all the apostles. He's, he points out um, James, Cephas, and John. Three. And, and I, when I read the text, I mean, I just think the big three. Right? We know James, Cephas, and John. These are the heavy hitters. Right? Peter, of course, was the main man, if you might say, the main apostle. And so he mentions the big ones, the big guns. And he went before them, talking with them, staying with them. And this is a long time after. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem. He's already been doing lots of work. Okay? Tons of work in churches, church planning, preaching, and so on and so forth. And now he's going to speak with the pillars. I want to kind of say something here about this. I know that the time frame here is talked a lot about, like, when did this occur? And they're trying to mesh it together with Acts. And was this, you know, before the Jerusalem Council? Was this after? Let me just say this. I don't think it necessarily matters as much for the general theological point of the text. But if you have questions about that, I'd be glad to deal with those later on today. But I'm not going to deal a whole lot with it right now, okay? Suffice to say this. He's going before these pillars, and at first, he says, I went before them privately, right, who seemed to be influential, and he set before them the gospel. Now, there's different interpretations of this. Uh, some people would say, well, Paul, he's questioning himself whether or not he's proclaiming really the full gospel, uh, the true gospel, and so he has to go to the apostles to get verification that he's doing the right thing. I don't think that's what's happening here. Um, because that kind of goes against what he's already been saying before. Like, he knows he's preaching the true gospel. He's already called anyone who preaches a gospel, a gospel contrary to the one we proclaim to you, let him be anathema. That's how sure he is. So it's not like he's going to the pillars and saying, hey, uh, you know, privately saying, am I, am I sure I'm doing the right thing here? He knows he's doing the right thing. But he's done a lot of work already. He's planted several churches already and he's bringing before them privately and telling them of all the work that he has done so in one way he's doing this so that they might recognize him because later on he's going to say when they recognized in me what God was doing in me they gave the right hand of fellowship to me they confirmed and recognized God is working in you the same way he is working through us. And he's, this is, should be very huge for the people that he's speaking to, for the Galatians, because he wants them to see that he is in line with all the other apostolic preaching that's been going on. If there's been any other claim that Paul's preaching a gospel that's different than Peter's, that should be laid to rest. That, that is not what's happening. He is proclaiming a gospel that men are justified by faith and faith alone in Christ and Christ alone. And Peter is proclaiming the exact same thing. He's sure of it, and he's going to Peter, and he's going to others, and they're confirming this together. Okay? This, the line, if you want to look with me, um, that I think is, should be one of the most important lines, I think, for the Galatians to hear is in verse 8. And I'll start in verse 7. He says, On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, and then verse 8, For he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. Paul, saying that line, I think is trying to communicate to the Galatians, you need to wake up. And you need to see God. Yes, you accept, everyone accepts Peter and others that God is working through him. You need to know that he is working through me as well. And they recognize it. And you need to recognize it as well. And I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself uh, to the points of application. But that's all right. Because they need to see that God is the one that's working through these men. Because if you're leaving the message, 
that they're proclaiming. You're not just turning your back on Paul. You're not turning your back on Peter. You're turning your back on God who's working through them. (coughs) And that's a serious primary issue. And it's a wake-up call for them because false brethren coming in are trying to corrupt this. They're trying to win them to their side. And he's trying to say, listen, we are servants of the Lord and the Lord is working through us and I'm in line with all the other pillar, big hitter apostles. And you need to see this and you need to know how serious it is. So he's upping it here. I'm, in, I'm confirmed with the other pillars. The Galatians hearers need to hear this third the third section. And don't worry, we'll go back and look at these in points of application in more detail. Paul could stop there. And that should be kind of good enough. Right? Paul could just say, I'm an apostle. Peter's an apostle. James is an apostle. John is an apostle. These are the, these are the three that were with Jesus. Really close. Right? All the time. He had his twelve, but then he had his three. Right? He could have just stopped there and said, I'm, I'm, I'm on par with them. I'm preaching the same gospel as them. Now, Galatians, stop this ridiculousness. Stop listening to these false brethren and get back to listening to the gospel. Let's correct this problem. This is an important issue. He doesn't stop there. He continues to tell this story of when he calls out Peter and confronts Peter. And I love this. Because keep in mind what he's trying to do. He's trying to prove to the Galatians that he's not doing this for man. He's not trying to impress man. That goes all the way back to verse 10. I'm not trying to impress man. I got this from the Lord. I'm in line and I'm in step with the other apostles. But then he goes and tells the story of when Cephas is in Antioch and they're sitting down and having this meal together. Certain people come in from the circumcision party, Jewish people, and Peter draws away. He steps away. Let's look at the text. Look at verse 11. He says, when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. And I certainly would like to have been a fly on the wall at that point, just because, you know, Peter and Paul, I mean, these are heavy hitters, right? Um, I just would like to have seen what that looked like. Kind of makes me like the hair stand up on my arms, but he says he opposed him to his face. Why? Because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. That's right, because a Jewish customer, you wouldn't do that. If a a Gentile touched a cup, the Jew would not use that cup. They would have to wash it and purify it and blah, blah, blah. We know this. But he's sitting down, Peter is, and he's apostle to the circumcised, to the Jews, That's his main area of ministry. But now he's sitting down totally fine, eating with Gentiles. And that's totally fine within the gospel. But when um, certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. In other words, you just picture a room. They're sitting down. We have a room down here. And you're eating with people and... Then walk in, you know, the Jewish brothers, or maybe not brothers, there's just a circumcision party. And he kind of draws away from the crowd that he was sitting down and eating with. Didn't want to be seen, associated, eating with that group of people. This is a problem. Paul's kind of like, with the story, the way he's kind of describing, he's kind of off to the side, kind of seeing this happen. Seeing it happen, right? Right? And he can see the hypocrisy. He can see that Peter, his problem as an apostle is that he's fearing man. The approval, he wants the approval of man. So he's actually pulling away from a certain group of people because he doesn't think he'll have the approval of those guys that just walked in the room. So you've got to see the boldness here. He's actually pointing out that the lead apostle, Peter, is doing an action for the approval of man. Back to verse 10. He was seeking the approval of man in that little small moment. And Paul saw that he was not in step with the truth of the gospel. That's a phrase that's repeated twice. Once in chapter 2 and here again. And he opposes Peter to his face. He has the boldness. He doesn't just see it happen and then later on, privately, 
like he did before, talk to him about certain things. This is a public matter because not, it's not just a, located with Peter. Other people kind of went with Peter. Even Barnabas himself, it says, even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. Verse 14, but when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, he called Peter out in front of everybody. Because it's a primary thing here. This is, this is not right. This is one apostle who is on par with another apostle calling out another apostle. You're stepping out of line. And this is remarkable. Because, I mean, Peter is acting very similar, isn't he, to where he kind of drew away from that young girl who was questioning him, do you know Jesus, do you know Jesus? And he's kind of actually doing something similar to the way he did things before. Paul realizes this needs to be addressed publicly. Why? Not because Paul's trying to one-up Peter. Please don't hear that. Paul's not trying to one-up Peter here. He's realizing that if people see this, the threat is against the truth of the gospel itself. That is what's going on. And Peter step, excuse me, Paul steps in and says, this needs to be dealt with because people, when they see this, they're going to make bad on the gospel itself. And Paul does not want that. When the Galatians hear this, what they should see is that P, uh, Paul has the, you might even say boldness, Holy Spirit boldness, to call out Peter. And once again, this actually wins credit back for him, doesn't it? So that, that he can get their ear. He is after their ear with all of this section so that he can say, you need to stop, you need to turn around, you need to listen to me because I have something very important to tell you. And he's breaking down all of that discrediting jargon that had been thrown on his character. Okay. Well, what can we do with this? I, I believe I can give you three points of application. There are definitely more. Um, I camped out a lot on this idea of you know, ministers laboring and laboring and laboring and kind of seeing members kind of go after false teaching. And I thought that would be a good point here. That would be, that would be very helpful. And certainly it would be. So if you, if you see that, you can, you can go with that. We can talk about it tonight. But I'm just pointing out three. And I, and I think that if, if you want to talk about more, we can talk about that. But these are the three that I want to give you. First point is this. And this comes from the whole text, right? To oppose the apostolic message is to oppose God and endanger your soul. I think this is the first point, broad point that I want to bring out. If you're opposing the apostolic message, then you're opposing God. It's not a man that you're opposing. It's God. It's God that you're opposing. And you're putting yourself in danger. Now, this is very serious. Paul does not start out this letter with easy tones. These are primary issues. The gospel is that issue. Paul talks about his own authorization as an apostle in this text, but the text as a whole is a wake-up call to the Galatians. This is a pastoral concern. He sees his flock going down a wrong path path and he's going after them to bring them back because he sees that their primary uh, the, the problem here is a primary issue it's not a secondary issue even though you do have to deal with secondary issues appropriately because they can bleed into primaries you never know where false teaching will stop right there's so many more false doctrines than there are one true doctrine right but this is a wake-up call to, Gal to the Galatians. This is why I really hit on that verse 8 of chapter 2. God who worked through Peter is working also through Paul. So if you start to entertain these other gospel, false gospel, false brethren teaching, you're putting yourself at risk. And you're putting yourself in a position that leads down to anathema. And he wants to call them back. That's the goal. That's the goal of the whole argument. Isn't that, though, the goal of all pastoral ministry? 
is constantly keeping the members here, focused on the one thing. And it's no wonder that people, when you're preaching the gospel, if you're truly preaching the gospel, there'll be plenty of people coming in trying to discredit you, maybe even from within. And Paul is laboring to say, no, I'm in step with the apostolic message, and it's from God, and you need to listen. So I think this is the first point, to oppose the apostolic message, to oppose God and endanger soul. The second point that I have here is this. The message matters more than the messenger. The message matters more than the messenger. Now, I do have to give credit to where that kind of came from. Uh, this is Dr. Aaron O'Kelly. I was sitting down uh, with him talking about this and so he basically said, ooh, this is a good line. So I took it from him. So it's recorded, and he can go and watch it later to get credit. Message matters more than the messenger. Make no mistake, Paul was authoritative as an apostle so long as he did not step away from the gospel. Right? This is why he says in chapter 1, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel contrary to the one we preached to you, let him be accursed. And his authority is only realized insofar as it stays in line with the truth of the gospel. This is why you have that phrase. His actions were not in step with the truth of the gospel. You also see it earlier in, in chapter 2. False brethren coming in to spy out the freedom. They, they are not in step with the gospel. Paul wants to make sure that he is in step with the truth of the gospel. It is so tempting, though, isn't it, as Christians to give preference to certain preachers or preaching styles, you might say, right? It, no doubt the people who are preaching to the Galatians, the false brethren, I think were probably very captivating speakers. And what they should have done, regardless of how captivating they were, they should have said, there's something wrong with that message, and I don't need to listen to that messenger. Right? But it's tempting. It's tempting to follow people. I mean, isn't this kind of like, even, even to base all theology on certain people, the Roman Catholics did this, right? Popes and rituals and all the rest was based on people. Mormonism does the same thing. Joseph Smith receives a vision. He's venerated and he's trusted blindly. And he says, right, they have their whole New Testament in addition to what we have here in the scriptures. And they're following this man. And his message is clearly against the teaching of the gospel. It's salvation by works. It's very similar to what they're dealing with here. But they follow men. Paul is laboring to say, listen, that the origin of my message is not from man. It is from God. The gospel is more important than the person that delivers it. Even Peter needed to be called out on this. Following man is so, is so hard, right? It's so powerful that even Peter, when he was walking not in step with the gospel, others followed, even Barnabas. And Barnabas and Paul earlier had just been given the right hand of fellowship by the other apostles. They agreed. They were accepted. Did the other apostles add anything to Paul? No. He said, they added nothing to me. They added nothing to me because you can't add to the gospel. The gospel is, is the main thing. But even here, they're following Peter into that hypocrisy. The thing that orients us, the anchor that orients us is the gospel message itself. Point number three. And this point may be a, even a more narrow point, but I think it is important because it captures the, the full message of Galatians. I want to show you where I got this. Look at, look at chapter two with me. And uh, kind of direct your attention to uh, verse 4. And let me go ahead while you're kind of locating these verses. Let me tell you the point. I want to say this. This is the last point. I think it's probably the most important point for you practically. Uh, the truth of the gospel, or you could even say the true gospel leads to freedom and not slavery. The true gospel or the truth of the gospel leads to freedom and not slavery. 
We have this phrase repeated twice, the truth of the gospel, the truth of the gospel. We have the context of Galatians with the themes of slavery and freedom, slavery and freedom over and over again for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery, chapter 5. And here we have this situation in verse 4 of chapter 2. It says, yet because of false brethren or brothers secretly brought in, notice this language, secretly brought in like spies, who slipped in to spy out what? Our freedom that we have in Christ. Secretly slipping in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they might bring us into slavery. To, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. This, I mean, it, it hits home for me because when, when you look at this book, there's sort of two messages that are being proclaimed, two options. There's a gospel according to man and there's a gospel according to God. The gospel according to man is the false gospel delivered by false brethren who envy the freedom of true brothers. Secretly spy, spying and seeing, I want to know why they're so free. And they're jealous of it. They're upset about it. And, they, and the only way to really battle that is to try to bring them into slavery as well. And they do it with a gospel that leads to slavery. The gospel according to man. What is that gospel? That's the gospel that preaches you need Jesus and. You need Jesus and you need circumcision, right? You need Jesus and you need Bible reading every day, right? You need Jesus and you need you, you're, you, to share the gospel with your neighbor uh, once a week, right? You, you could fill it in with anything, but Jesus alone doesn't give enough peace. You have to have him and something else. Men in our pride are always trying to get a little skin into the game when it comes to our salvation. This is what Paul talks about in Romans, right? We are justified by faith. We are counted righteous by faith, right? Where then is boasting? It is excluded. That's the first thing he attacks when he talks about being justified. You have nothing to do with your salvation at all. And I'm not going to say other than because dead men don't get up and be alive by themselves. They're called to life by Christ. We are justified by faith and faith alone in Christ and in Christ alone. And that is the gospel of God and that leads to freedom. The gospel according to man is man trying to get a little skin in the game. It's in honor of man. They're trying to get the Galatians on their side so that they might boast in their flesh. We've got five from the Galatians this week. Right, and so on and so forth. And it's all man-centered. It's bringing man's works into the equation. It's man, 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 but it just leads to shackles on your wrists. And you might advance greatly, but you're not going upward. Right? You just have shackles. You have Jesus and. and whatever you fill in that blank with, it's just, that's what's keeping you bound. The gospel of God is... You can do nothing for your salvation, but God has done absolutely everything necessary. And it's entirely of grace. Verse 16, chapter 1, God was pleased to reveal his son in me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Paul understood this. He's going on the road to Damascus, right? He's, he's about to persecute the church of God. So extremely zealous was he. He was bound. He wasn't free. What happened in that moment? God showed up. Christ showed up. And saved him. Entirely by grace. Saved him. And Paul is preaching this message to the Galatians. And to everyone. The grace of God leads to freedom. The gospel of God leads to freedom. When we want to try to add to that by saying, well, you need Jesus and, you need its grace and, the shackles come back with it. 
These false brethren, jealous of the freedom that Christians have, are trying to, in their jealousy, <coughs> steal them away. Put the shackles back on. Paul says, we didn't yield to them even for a moment. And he goes on in chapter 5 and he tells the Galatians to do the exact same thing. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. So, brothers and sisters, do you see yourself as free? Do you see yourself as counted 100% righteous before God? That is the beauty of the gospel. That we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And when God sees us, he sees us as pure before the law. Which is a totally, <laughs> totally audacious claim to say that, I, that Michael Lee has fulfilled in Christ every law of God because of Jesus. That, that, that's totally crazy to say. I remember having a conversation once again with a, with a Mormon in my home talking about this very thing. And I said to him, the difference between your gospel and my gospel is this. Is that when God looks at Michael Lee, he sees Michael Lee as 100% righteous, as though I was fulfilled already every single command of God. And his eyes were just this big. Because it wouldn't allow it. His, his theology doesn't allow it. You would have thought that I had blasphemed God. You would have thought that I had blasphemed. It was almost as though he was nervous to be in the room. And I would love to have said, uh, I would love to say that he fell down right there and, and worshipped the Lord. He just walked out with his chains on. Just walked out with his chain on. Because only God can save that. The article, Martin Luther says, the article of justification is fragile. Not in itself, but in us. Martin Luther says, I know how quickly a person can forfeit the joy of the gospel. I know in what slippery places even those who stand seem to have a good footing in the matters of faith. And in the midst of conflict... When we should be consoling ourselves with the gospel, the law rears up and begins to rage all over our conscience. What makes matters worse is that one half of ourselves, our own reason, stands against us. What makes matters worse, uh, excuse me, um, is that the flesh resists the spirit, as Paul says. Therefore, we teach that to know Christ and to believe in him is no achievement of man, but it is the gift of God. God alone can create and pers preserve faith in us. God creates faith in us through the word. He increases, strengthens, and confirms faith in us through his word. Hence, the best service that anybody can render God is diligently to hear and read God's word. On the other hand, nothing is more perilous than to be weary of the word of God. Thinking that he knows enough, a person begins little by little to despise the word until he has lost Christ and the gospel altogether. So let every believer carefully learn the gospel. Let him continue in humble prayer. We are molested not by puny foes, but by mighty ones, foes who never grow tired of warring against us. These are our, our enemies are many. Our own flesh, the world, the law, sin, death, the devil himself. And so I want to end then... Um, by calling us as a church to continue to hold to the truth of the gospel and remember our freedom and not to be afraid to be free. I think it's very common for us in our church culture to, to submit again to a yoke of slavery and let us encourage each other not to do so. If you are a believer this morning, I pray that you are encouraged. If you're not a believer, and you want freedom, then hear this. You have sinned, and there's nothing you can do to fix that. Even if you were to stop sinning today for the rest of your life, if that were even possible, which it's not, if that were possible, you've still already sinned against an eternal God, and you have an eternal debt that you could spend an eternity trying to satisfy and never suffice. So a second start wouldn't help a fresh start wouldn't help. Please, God, don't give me a fresh start. I'll mess that up too. Right? If you're a non-believer, you have sinned. And God requires perfection to enter into heaven. And none of us can meet that standard. 
But Christ has. He has lived a perfect life, the life that we could not live if we were given a thousand tries. He has lived that life. And the death he died on the cross, he suffered under the wrath of God for our sins. On the third day, he rose again, beating sin, Satan, and death. And if you will repent and believe in him, you will be absolutely free. You will be counted 100% righteous. And from the moment on, get this, right? From the moment on, for the rest of your life, all into eternity, God will always see you. Always see you as perfect because you're clothed in Christ. You will have always fulfilled every law of God because of Christ. That's the freedom. You can't change that. You think, oh, I want to become a Christian, but I know that I'm going to fail later on in life. Sure, but you're clothed with Christ's righteousness. His Entirely. That's freedom. You're free to go and just enjoy being God's child. Mistakes and all. And so I call you to that. God commands you to repent and believe. If you want to talk to me after the service, I would love to talk to you. Um, or just about anything. If you want to share a prayer request or a struggle, I'd love to pray with you. Um, but let's go ahead and pray, and then we will have our closing uh, song and our benediction. Father, um, Think about Paul and how astonished he was, how quick.